issues that, as you mentioned a few minutes ago, could very well work their way up to the Court of Appeal and the California Supreme Court to try to resolve a very thorny issue of what do you do with a cop on the beach who uses a gun? Is he really the same as the guy who wants to hold up the 7-Eleven, or do you treat the police officer differently? These are all issues swirling around in the judge's head, trying desperately to do what's fair and what's right for the people and for... So the judge is confused because of the gun enhancement thing. Listen. Did either one of them address this issue of the gun enhancement to the jury? Haggling over the gun enhancement. Absolutely. It was a big issue. The defense's position was very clear, that the evidence was overwhelming, that Officer Meserly had absolutely no intention to shoot a gun. They showed the video over and over of him fumbling for the taser and then going for the gun. On the other hand, the prosecution had their point. They said that there was evidence that Meserly said, I think he's going for his gun. And, of course, what more rational inference, if you see somebody on the ground who's struggling, who's not showing his hands, who may be going for a gun. Not showing his hands. His hands was behind his back. He didn't intend to shoot that gun. We know he shot it. We know he drew it. How many times have you been handcuffed with your handcuffs in the front of you? All of those pieces of evidence, yes, were very fully. Pow, that's where he shoots him, right there. And, Royal, I know you mentioned the victim's statements a short time ago, and Claudine was telling us they were extremely emotional, very heavy, even Oscar Brandt's uncle raising his voice, being told by the judge not to yell. Yeah. So you look at the big picture, man. They're about to do a grave injustice to all Americans. Because a person with the power to kill somebody else must weigh this power correctly. The guy was handcuffed with his hands behind his back. He knows all the evidence. And he shot. He didn't have a pretty solid notion about where he was going to come out on the sentencing, even before Meserly made his tearful statement, even before the five family members. So they just called everybody back into the courtroom again. He was pretty well locked in. Now, the fact that he said he was troubled by the gun enhancement issue, didn't really know what to do with it, and listened to hours and hours of arguments today from lawyers from both sides, well, that is a consideration. That suggests that maybe the judge still is mulling it over. Now, see, he can get up to four years, you know, for the manslaughter or whatever. And then he can get up to ten years for the gun enhancement. Now, say the judge gives him four years for the gun enhancement and four years for the manslaughter. He can run them together, and that's four years at one time. Or he can run them concurrent, one after the other, which would be eight years. Now, they're also saying that the judge could give Measurely three years and throw out the gun enhancement. With the gun enhancement, Measurely must serve 85% of his time. Without the gun enhancement, Measurely only has to serve 50% of his time. Well, it certainly could have an impact on the judge because it was very emotional. As did the Grant family. Who knows whether they're receptive to this. It's been such a fascinating turnabout. Here's a guy who went from being totally silent, stonewalling. He wouldn't talk to friends. He wouldn't talk to officials. Probably on advice of attorneys. Well, listen, now he's talking to everybody. He discussed what happened, and people wanted him to say, hey, was it a mistake? Was it an accident? But he wouldn't do it for the longest time, and it caused people to be very frustrated. Then we move into the trial itself, and what do you know? The shock comes. He's on the stand. It was a surprise to everybody. He testifies on the stand, which a lot of people in high-profile cases do not do, figuring it's too much of a gamble. And then, the day he's convicted, you'll recall, he writes that emotional letter, essentially saying how sorry he was, how he regretted it so much, and now he gives television interviews, as well as giving the victim the statement in front of the court. So he's gone from being the silent mystery man to being very talkative. Bottom line, it may have some impact on the judge, but as I said a minute ago, I think probably the judge... See, this is what happens in our society. ...his notion pretty well established even before today's hearing as to how he felt about where the victims were coming. One of these people makes a mistake and fucks up and kills one of us, and there will be no justice. If I made plug, if I came home and there was a man raping my fucking wife, and I tied him up 
and my homeboy walked in and blew dude's head off we're going to prison if my brother-in-law came in and see I got dude tied up that just raped his sister and killed him we're going to prison Johannes Measurely shouldn't be standing up there by himself. There's other cops that was there. And you have to look at this, man. Look at the listen to them. Listen to what the experts are saying. Shit. Come on, experts, say something. Good state. I know it was emotional. But I've got to tell you, when He's crying and emotional now. He's letting people see he's got feelings. You should have had feelings when you was up on that bar platform when you shot an unarmed man when your intention was to torture him. Watch. We have been given a show. Similar to the OJ show, but bigger. Not from a piece of paper, not from something that most people are going to think, wait a minute, did you write that? But your attorneys helped you, didn't they? And they sort of pushed you in and gave you ideas. No, no. You get up there and do it yourself. All right. We're going to keep hearing from Michael Cardoza as well as uh, our legal analyst down in Los Angeles, Royal Oaks, in just a minute. But right now, we want to go to Jenna Katsuyama, BTV reporter in Oakland, uh, talking a little bit about how the city is preparing for the worst case scenario. Good afternoon, Jenna. Hi, Tori. Well, we're right down here. What's the worst case scenario? Broadway, where a lot of the damage happened last time. Let me tell you, it's very much a. Uh, yeah, what, what is the worst case scenario? What's the worst case scenario? Time served. You're going to be getting four years uh, for manslaughter and four years for the gun enhancement. You'll run them, you know. Not back to back. You know, I'm simultaneous to current. You could, you know, do four years, give them four years, and then give them time served. Or they're going to throw out the gun enhancement and give them two years. So that means he only has to do a year and a half for murder. What, what do you think is going to be the outcome? I know. I believe he's going to be set free. Your honest measurely will be set free today. I got a feeling he will walk out that courtroom because when the judge says I have a problem with the gun enhancement, the gun enhancement means he intentionally uses a gun. But the involuntary manslaughter meant it was an accident. And if it's an accident, that means he didn't intend to use his gun. The judge is confused on those points. And you have to look. There is loopholes built into that conviction they gave him because they added the gun enhancement. Because the gun enhancement pretty much contradicts the involuntary manslaughter, the judge is confused. So he's going to end up throwing the gun out. I think he's going to throw the gun enhancement out. Because I don't think this judge has enough guts to give this guy 10 years you know and the 4 to make it the 14 run them back to back he's not gonna do that they've already let us know let's see the ladies calling in right now let's see what happens She's calling it in now them, uh, to come out and tell us what the judge has decided you know at this point it is a waiting game of sorts uh, but uh, we know that all the arguments have been made, and at this point, hopefully, within this next 15 minutes, we'll be able to get it in this 15 minutes right here, live, as I get it from KTV News, News, San Francisco. One that goes into a kind of entryway, and then one that goes a little bit further, and there are no room, no chairs available in the courtroom for any more people to go into. But I can actually see the secondary doors that are open into the courtroom right now. Everyone is still seated uh, in there listening to what the judge has to say. The judge is uh, talking, of course. You can hear some that. Because that entryway is filled with uh, police officers and other security who are also you know, trying to listen to what the judge is saying. So at this point, again, we are in a holding pattern uh, waiting to see that the society has a lot of options I know that we've talked about today uh, between uh, the manslaughter conviction and the gun enhancement charge. Right back. Claudine Michael Cardoza here. Uh, do 
Do you expect, you, you've sat through big trials before, I've been in big trials before, I know we're waiting for them to come out the door, but do you expect that there may be an emotional outburst in that courtroom that you're going to hear before you see people coming out? Uh, I think there might be. I think uh, Judge Gary has uh, made it very clear that he will not tolerate uh, much courtroom. He has been uh, described by all the deputies out here who obviously are in his courtroom for many, many uh, proceedings, saying that he is a, a take-no-nonsense kind of judge. However, he's also made it very clear that he's very cognizant of uh, how much this case has meant to the community and how passionate people are. And again, the emotions are all running, already running very, very high in here. Uh, Cephas Johnson, uh, Officer Rand's uncle, actually was told by the judge not to yell. But when I talked to him when he came out of that, that very incident, and I said, you know, do you think he was really listening to you? He said, well, I will raise my voice so he can make sure to hear me. Uh, he did not seem... Um, well... Well, um, let's hope the system does work. I don't think I'll be able to catch this uh, live for you. So, this video will be ending in a couple of minutes. And, uh, The people are rallying outside the courtroom. Oscar Grant supporters, measurely supporters. It's coming down to the wire, folks. Will American people be shot in the arm again? Those people who are here to protect us get away with killing us. What will happen? Two bailiffs during the trial, but when that verdict comes back, or when a judge is going to sentence, there's a plethora, a whole bunch of sheriffs that walk into that courtroom, five, ten, fifteen, sometimes that just line that courtroom. Have you noticed anything like that? Well, there are a, a lot of sheriff deputies out here uh, who, like, frankly, because of the size of this courtroom, and yes, I've seen that as well in the high-profile cases, or cases where uh, obviously people are very emotional. This is a very small courtroom. Hmm. The number of people inside the courtroom. They better hurry up and, and tell us what's happening with the sentencing. I'm mean, getting uptight. Notice how handsome I look now in these videos? I do. Well, I'm going to go ahead and end this video. Fire up another one. There was a crowd. Yeah, I heard some screaming from the crowd. But it's. We're going to keep 